It has been said that modern Belarus straddles the fault line between Western Europe and Eurasian civilizations. And today it continues to face a choice between its recent affinity with Russia to the east and the gravitational pull of Europe to its west. This is Minsk, the capital of Belarus. I was somewhat surprised to find out that it's technically the 11th most populous city in Europe. Its 2 million inhabitants put it on par with Vienna and even Paris. But few people would ever think of Minsk in the same way as either of those. That is probably because it is often referred to as the last dictatorship in Europe. As the country has been ruled by Alexander Lukashenko for over two decades, and in recent years, Belarus has become synonymous with repression and the plight for democratic change. Especially after Lukashenko's recent stunts, violating human rights, worsening the migrant crisis in Europe, diverting a public flight over Belarusian airspace, and supporting the Russian invasion of Ukraine. But reality in Belarus is likely more complex than simply an evil dictator or what mainstream media is willing to portray. For one, there is the matter of people's opinion. While it's comforting to think that there were mass protests in Belarus and that all Belarusians are actively seeking an end to Lukashenko, a large percentage of the population is still heavily influenced by Russian state media. As a result, a significant percentage believe that Russia will prevail in Ukraine, that Russia is their economic ally and that the Soviet Union should be remade. While those who consume independent and Ukrainian media tend to believe that Ukraine will prevail and that if Belarus joined the European Economic Zone, they would prosper. In other words, supporters of the current Belarusian regime take information mainly from the Belarusian and Russian state media, while opponents of the current government mostly consume non-state Belarusian and Russian media, and to a slightly lesser extent Ukrainian. The result of this is that Belarusians have vastly different opinions regarding the actions their country should take as they live in different information spaces. This is all according to a survey done by Chatham House. In their research, they found that over 28% of the population supports Russia's actions in Ukraine, and a small percentage of them even support direct military involvement on Russia's side, while only 15% would be willing to condemn Russian action and fewer still support the Ukrainian cause or would be willing to fight for them directly. The majority, however, are united in their wish to stay out of the conflict and a large percentage are simply uninterested or ambivalent. It seems to me that Belarus, taken as a whole, is neither Russia's pawn nor pro-Western. It's literally in between. The situation comes into further focus if we consider Belarusian involvement in Ukraine, which is multifaceted. On the one hand, the government allowed Russian armed forces to perform military drills on its territory. Then it allowed Russia to stage part of the invasion from its territory, giving Russia the shortest possible land route to Kyiv. And it gave permission for Russian missile launchers to be stationed on its territory to shoot at Ukrainian targets. But on the other hand, Belarus has created the Kastus Kalinowski Regiment, a growing group of Belarusian volunteers defending Ukraine in a direct response to Russia's full-scale invasion. It is publicly recruiting and training soldiers for combat operations and appears to be largely funded by public donations. Their public motto is First Ukraine, then Belarus. While a big majority of foreign soldiers who have volunteered to fight for Ukraine have come and gone, it is the Belarusians who have stayed, making up the largest group of foreign fighters in Ukraine. This is all despite the fact that any Belarusian who was caught fighting on the Ukrainian side would be trialed and sentenced back at home. Hence, these soldiers are opposing what their government wants them to do and are labelled as fanatics and traitors by Lukashenko himself. So, how come Belarus is so fractured? How did Lukashenko hold this country together? What role does the Kremlin play in all of this? And what is the cause of these soldiers in Ukraine? Let's roll! It has been argued that the reason Belarus is so divided is due to an undeveloped or unclear historical identity. 
What exactly is Belarus? What is its history? Well, there just isn't a straightforward answer to these questions, and it's clearly a very political matter, the complexity of which can be spun and manipulated for any end or justification. Let me show you what I mean. Belarus is a landlocked country located in Eastern Europe, bordered by Russia to the east and northeast, Ukraine to the south, Poland to the west, and Lithuania and Latvia to the northwest. The country's landscape is primarily flat. In other words, these 200,000 square kilometers of land are mostly defenseless and simultaneously surrounded on all sides by much larger historic entities. By being pulled in a manner of different directions, Belarus has passed through all commonly cited stages of political development, from a progressive medieval monarchy to totalitarianism, then to modern democracy, and now back to totalitarianism. Long before the modern borders were established, the territory of Belarus was part of Kievan Rus, a medieval state that emerged in the 9th century and played a crucial role in the development of the Slavic culture and traditions. Many historians consider this period, and in particular the development of the medieval city of Polotsk, to be the first embodiment of a culture which would eventually emerge as the country we know today. In the 14th century, the Grand Duchy of Lithuania and later the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth, emerged as a dominant power in the region, uniting various tribes and principalities. It was one of the most liberally governed European states of the time. The Lithuanian rulers were known for their tolerance towards different cultures and religions, which led to flourishing of art, literature and architecture. But it also meant strong Lithuanian and Polish influence in the region. Later in the 18th century, the Commonwealth faced numerous internal and external challenges, including political instability, economic decline, and military defeats. Meanwhile, neighboring powers such as Russia, Prussia, and Austria were growing stronger and more assertive. They saw the Commonwealth as an opportunity to expand their own territories and influence and they began to tear it down, one conflict at a time. In the end, this led to the partitioning of the Commonwealth territories amongst Russia, Prussia and Austria. Under Russian rule, the territories of Belarus became a hub of industry and agriculture, with numerous factories, mines and railways being built across the country. However, this also led to a loss of cultural and linguistic identity as the Russian authorities imposed their language and customs. The aftermath of the First World War and the Bolshevik Revolution created the opportunity for the first real inception of Belarus as a modern country, the briefly existing Belarusian Democratic Republic of 1918, also occasionally referred to as White Russia, which ceased to exist after the Polish-Soviet War of 1919. Interestingly, its government today, known as the Rada of the Belarusian Democratic Republic, went into exile and still exists today. It's currently headquartered in Ottawa. During World War II, Belarus suffered greatly as it was occupied by Nazi Germany and became the site of some of the deadliest battles and atrocities of the war. It is estimated that a quarter of the population died. Belarus used to have one of the largest populations of Jews in Europe, up to 900,000 people. Compare that estimate to the 2019 national census, which has 13,705 self-identifying Jews left. After the war, Belarus became a republic of the Soviet Union and experienced a period of rapid industrialization and modernization. However, this also came at a cost, as the Soviet authorities once again suppressed dissent and opposition and stifled the development of independent thought and culture. It wasn't really a problem, as in the early days of post-war Belarus, living conditions improved rapidly and the Belarusian culture had already been Russified to a large extent. Then, when the Soviet Union was dismantled in 1991, Belarus emerged as an independent state and enacted a constitution with democracy and the rule of law as its core principles at first. If you compare Belarus to its neighbors, its autonomy did not come from many years of struggle or a defined independence movement, but rather it is said that independence was just thrust upon it, and the recent assimilation with Russia gave rise to what some analysts call a culture of Soviet-Belarusian 
patriotism. Lukashenko himself defined Belarusians as Russians but of higher grade, confessing that we have not yet found an ideal that would lead the people to battle. So as a result, Lukashenko's Belarus was initially distinguished by people's nostalgia for their Soviet past. When asked, would you like the Soviet Union to be restored, the vast majority of people responded positively in 1993. And this trend continued up to early 2000s, at which point the opinion shifts significantly, perhaps something more in line with the earlier polls shown with some 20-30% to being strongly in favour of all things Russian. And Lukashenko knows this. His ability to retain power is a result of him being able to play one side against the other balancing his country on its indecisiveness. After gaining independence from the Soviet Union in 1991, Belarus had to transition from a centrally planned economy to a market-based system. This transition was complex and time-consuming. When Lukashenko arrived on the scene, the economy of Belarus was in freefall, leading to economic disruptions and uncertainties. Additionally, the breakup of the Soviet Union meant the loss of economic integration and support from other Soviet republics. Belarus heavily relied on the Soviet market for its exports and imports, and the sudden loss of trade ties as well as access to stable gas and oil supplies created instability in Belarus's economy. Furthermore, the pace of economic reform in Belarus was slower compared to other post-Soviet countries, with the government maintaining significant control over key sectors of the economy, hindering the growth of a dynamic private sector and limiting economic development not to mention the corruption, bureaucracy and lack of transparency. These factors deterred foreign investments and hindered the development of a vibrant and competitive private sector. Also, the early 1990s as a whole was a shock in Europe, with many economic downturns and newly furnished democracies scrambling to create the post-war order. It was a mess. Lukashenko was brought to power following a democratic and a well-contested election in 1994. Since then, he has won every single election, extending his reign to the present day, and has greatly expanded his power with various referendums, essentially becoming a dictator. As a result, the 1994 presidential election is considered to date the only free election held in Belarus since it broke away from the Soviet Union. So in 1994, the Belarusian GDP fell by some 19%, but this free fall stopped shortly after Lukashenko came to power, gaining momentum up until 2010, at which point it began to plateau. So Lukashenko was certainly able to cash in on the goodwill of the people who saw him as the savior of the economy. And Belarus's Human Development Index has been rising steadily since 1995, achieving very high development in 60th place, being placed just above Panama, Georgia and Serbia, but below Uruguay and Kazakhstan. Its health system is also said to be particularly efficient with a very low infant mortality rate of just 2.9% compared to 6.6% in Russia or 3.7% in the United Kingdom. But Belarus did not commit to a fully democratic model, instead opting for a mixed economic style with only some 25-30% to of businesses being privately owned. The result has been described as a welfare state or market socialist. And therein lies one possible downfall of Lukashenko's Belarus. His economic model has never functioned properly and is far too dependent on Russia, which has essentially financed all the positive economic developments, giving Lukashenko breathing room to stay in power. The Kremlin has massive economic leverage over Belarus which it uses to exert influence and promote its agenda through a mix of threats and incentives. For starters, Russia imposed a ban on Belarusian milk products in 2009 due to Lukashenko's refusal to recognize the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, as well as his unwillingness to let Russia privatize the Belarusian milk industry. But more crucially, Despite some efforts to diversify its energy supplies, such as importing oil from Venezuela in the late 2000s, and more recently from Azerbaijan, the USA and Norway, Belarus remains highly dependent on Russian energy imports. For example, it imports 100% of its natural gas from Russia at the lowest prices in Europe. Naturally, any increase in the price of gas has a strong impact on the competitiveness of Belarusian industrial enterprises. 
The preferential gas prices it receives are in exchange for concessions like closer political ties and military cooperation. Belarus has been importing several types of oil from Russia. Refining and re-exporting has become one of the most important sources of revenue for the country. As a result, Belarus remains one of the former Soviet Union's most energy-dependent countries, second only to Moldova. Furthermore, Belarus has received billions of dollars of loans, starting from the early 90s. And while Belarus tried to diversify its credit portfolio, Russia remained the main provider of financial assistance. So while Belarus may wish to diversify its economy and become more integrated with the West, it's being discouraged from doing so. Moscow provides easy money, happily keeping Lukashenko cushion and autocracy alive. A recently leaked document obtained by international journalists shows that Russia plans to absorb Belarus by 2030. The long-term plan aims to establish a common union state under Russian leadership. While Belarus and Russia are already part of a union state based on a 1999 agreement, the leaked document suggests Russia's intentions go beyond economic integration and lean towards complete annexation. The Kremlin really is attempting to reconstruct the Soviet Union and Belarus is a crucial piece of that puzzle. Despite the generosity of the Kremlin, Lukashenko's economic model is struggling and that is ultimately what may change the most opinions. Incomes earned by Belarusians have remained unchanged for many years, standing around $500 or $600 per month similar to the average salary levels recorded in 2010. Combined with an annual rate of inflation, this has resulted in a gradual decline in the people's living standards. It has been said, if Lukashenko had left office before his re-election in 2010, he would have been remembered as a great leader. But of course he didn't, and his reputation is suffering as it is becoming increasingly obvious that Belarus is falling behind other post-Soviet countries. This is especially evident to the younger generation who are receiving less of their news from state-run media and Russia. And then Lukashenko's popularity hit an all-time low following the 2020 elections, when government-sponsored TV channel announced that Lukashenko had won with over 80% of the vote more or less the same kind of landslide victory he has been achieving ever since 1994. Considering the context of the changing economic conditions, even the people who supported him thought the results to be surprising. There was little doubt remaining with regards to the legitimacy of the elections, leading to the largest protests in Belarus's history. Slippers were pelted at the police and chants such as You cockroach and resign you rat were heard. Sergei Tikhanovsky, a businessman and blogger, sparked this by comparing Lukashenko to a dictatorial cockroach from a children's story. But the protesters were beaten down horribly. Many witnesses and victims reported extreme violence from the police and widespread violation of human rights. This included excessive force, torture, denial of medical assistance and even rape. I will not read the accounts of some of the protesters who were detained or arrested. The details are too heavy. These protests also played into the hands of the Kremlin, giving Russia greater bargaining power over the Belarusian regime, as Lukashenko needed significant financial resources to suppress the pro-democracy movement and keep the situation under control. And the Kremlin likely used this leverage in order to aid its attack on Ukraine. The Kastos Kalinowski Regiment in Ukraine is a natural evolution of the protests and a response to the heavy governmental repression created in March 2022. The regiment currently consists of the Volod and Litvin battalions. On Wikipedia it states that it's made up of 1,500 soldiers, but officially such detailed information is not available since each soldier would want to keep his identity a secret. Volunteers of the regiment consider Russia to be a common enemy of Belarus and Ukraine. For them, the liberation of Ukraine from Russia will lead to the weakening and the beginning of the collapse of the Putin regime. 
This will make it possible to put an end to the history of the existence of Lukashenko's regime. In other words, the liberation of Belarus through the liberation of Ukraine. The Belarusian regiment sees the future of the Belarusian nation as an integral cultural, political, military and economic part of the European space and wishes to redeem its historical ties to Baltic states, Poland and Ukraine. On their website they state that Ukraine, whose independence we defend today, has declared its firm intention to become part of the EU and NATO. That is why we believe that the natural goal for Belarus is to strive to join the European Union and become a part of NATO. Based on recent events, we see that the countries of the Baltic Black Sea region are our natural allies. The European development vector of Belarus can be ensured only after the deoccupation of our state from Russian troops and the dismantling of Lukashenko's internal dictatorial regime. The viewpoint of the regiment are echoed by Belarus's democratic opposition. Svetlana Chikhanovskaya, who ran against Lukashenko in 2020 and claims to have received 60 to 70 percent of the actual votes. In case Ukraine fails in this war, uh, there will be no opportunity for Belarusians to get rid of Lukashenko. Of course, there will be a partisan fight. We will continue you know, to um, fight undergroundly uh, in Belarus, but uh, Lukashenko will feel, will feel much stronger uh, when, if uh, Russia prevails. And we understand that it will be region of uh, instability, region of constant threat to uh, European countries. But when uh, Ukraine wins, it will be a huge opportunity for Belarusians for the second, for the next wave of uprising and uh, having this extreme weakness of uh, uh, Lukashenko at that very moment. We could uh, attract more and more people in, in our movement, brave people, and it will be much easier for uh, us to um, uh, get rid of Lukashenko's regime because nomenclatura, people from military, they will understand that uh, Lukashenko is so weak that it's the very moment when we uh, can do what we planned, uh, what we wanted in 2020. We can bring our country at last to new elections and release political prisoners. Whether or not Belarus is split, ambivalent or becoming more Western, the conflict in Ukraine will play an exceptionally important role in the future of the country. If Putin's regime loses power, then so will Lukashenko's, and Belarus will have an opportunity to change its course. What route it will take is by no means a foregone conclusion. However, it is now clear to me how the conflict in Ukraine is about so much more than just Ukraine. A win will mean the weakening of Putin's authority in all post-Soviet countries, most of all Belarus. And it could mean further economic liberation of millions of Europeans who are still oppressed by remnants of Soviet legacy. Next, learn about the significance of Kaliningrad, where history is bound to repeat itself. And this is my Patreon map. Everyone here has contributed to my channel directly, and I'm massively thankful to each one of you. Geoperspective out.